came into the English language 30, 30 some years ago, 1960 to 1965. Prior to that, all the Vedic knowledge was within the Sanskrit language. At different times during the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s, philosophers from Europe ventured to India um, <clears throat> and embarked on a journey a little different than previous explorers to India. As far back as Alexander the Great, explorers were in search of conquest. Conquest meant wealth, slaves, acquiring land, and uh, these types of things. Many invasions of uh, India occurred in these bygone days. But around the 17 and 1800s, although there was there was another there was a there was an economic invasion in India that was the East India Company, which later led to the British Raj and 200 years of domination in India. At that time, there was another conquest that was different than any other before, at least that we can uh, historically find. And there was a, a conquest of knowledge in India. And at that time, uh, a good number of the European nations sent their scholars to research the uh, ancient literatures of India. Some of them learned <coughs> Sanskrit. And many of these books returned to European countries, and particularly Germany. And um, of course later on something very bad happened uh, because of misappropriation of knowledge in Germany with what was called the rise of the Aryan Empire. A misappropriation of knowledge. The Understanding that there was a race of people called Aryans from ancient times, which were the superior race, this knowledge comes from the Vedas. The Vedic people and the people of India once upon a time were Aryans. But uh, in Germany this took a perverted form. Even the swastika is adopted from the Vedic literature. It's, uh, it's printed on temples, it's printed on birthday cards, greeting cards, wedding cards, it's considered a very auspicious symbol. And uh, even the Boy Scouts of America prior to World War II used to distribute swastikas on little pendants for uh, fundraisers. And uh, at least half a dozen other very orthodox American organizations used the swastika at, at different times. But when Hitler adopted it, and twisted it, and twisted the whole, th the whole knowledge about Aryan civilization, then it became the most hated symbol of the 20th century, and still remains so. So, <clears throat> it is said that during that time, when, uh, it is said that even knowledge for the U-2 missile uh, was taken from the, the Vedas, because the Vedas speak of missiles, flying saucers, Interplanet interplanetary communication, all these things going on in a very, very ancient time. Now, of course, some people may say, what is the proof? What is the proof? And, and like many things, proof is nominal. But we, we must say that even to think about it 2,000 years ago is a very great thing. When many of the people in the world up until four centuries ago or five centuries ago, five centuries ago were considering the world as flat. In five centuries ago, in India, you could possibly find a group of educated people having a talk about life on other planets and interplanetary communication, and the world was round. It was never flat in the Vedic knowledge, but it has only been round in our <laughs> worldview for a few centuries. So, once I'm discussing with a professor from Helsinki University, where is it? I believe in Finland, <coughs> or wherever it is, I forget which country. Helsinki, but uh, he, he gave that much credit. Well, if the philosophers, the authors of these ancient books, if they could even think about these things, if their minds were free enough to think about the even possibilities of these things, whether they could do it or not, that is definitely a credit to their culture. Because what happens is <clears throat> cultures all over the world are very restricted in their thinking. We have, a, we have a saying in the modern age, learn to think beyond the square, learn to think beyond the box. It's it means that we, have, we're, we just get to a point, even today, in science and thinking, and we just box ourselves in, 
and we don't want to go beyond that. And then after a while, some bigger thinkers, they think beyond our present understanding for us. Well, most of the knowledge in the world that we have today in terms of science and all these things and discoveries, this is, this is definitely discovery. I mean, people are researching and discovering, and they are speculating. Therefore, many, many mistakes are made, and the progress is very, very slow. For some peculiar reason, a hundred years ago, scientists thought that women had a 32-ounce brain and men had a 64-ounce brain. This was a biological finding, which later was proved completely wrong. Of course, probably women were very happy to, to accept that at that time because a hundred years before that, women weren't believed to have a soul. <laughs> like dogs, like animals, women didn't have souls in Christianity until a couple hundred years ago. So the ladies have really been upgraded step by step. <laughs> now you have a 64-ounce brain and a soul. <laughs> These were never the considerations in the Vedic knowledge. Never did they have such considerations. Of course, I don't, I don't know if they went around measuring the size of everyone's brain, but certainly everyone had a soul. And that's the most important thing. Everyone not had a soul. Everyone is a soul. See, in many religions, they think God has a book, and you've got a soul, that's like a social security number. And you've got a good column and a bad column, and these marks go against your soul. Your soul means your record. Uh, and in many cases, um, religious worldviews consider that we, this, this is what we are. We are this body, and when we are raised from the dead, we'll come up with us, oh, we're back having been in the grave for 600 years, and shake off the dust and you know, loosen up the joints and, and march on to heaven. Resurrection of the dead. But uh, there are lots of problems in the, those types of theologies. You see. There's, a, there's a theology, I believe it's the Mormons, they believe that when you perfect your life as a Mormon, you get to rule your own universe on behalf of God. And your family lives there with you, and you are the head of a universe. You control, it's kind of like a Star Trek planet. You thing. Planet. You get a planet. Is it a planet? I thought you got a universe. I think you get a universe, a planet and a universe. And your family is there with you. So I asked one priest once, I said, if that's true and you become a good Mormon, you know, perfected Mormon and you get to your own planet, your own universe, and your family is there with you. He said, that's right. I said, your sons, your daughter, your wife, everybody's there. He said, yes. I said, what if your son becomes a perfected Mormon? And he moves on and gets his own planet. So who's in your family? It's just you and mom there alone, you know. Retired. Kids are all grown up and got their own planet. <laughs> so, it doesn't, when we think out a lot of these ideologies of the end of life, the goal of life, the perfection of heaven, and so many things, many problems arise. I saw a painting once, the idea of heaven. There was, it was springtime or summer. Nice, nice climate. And Everyone was sitting around by a pool. Kids were off playing badminton. And Jesus was walking. And everybody's in shorts and, you know, summer, you know, lawn attire. And Jesus was walking around with a tray of lemon juice. <laughs> <laughs> Serving everybody drinks. And he was in his long hair, beard, and, you know, like hippie attire, you know. And he was serving. And their concept was in heaven, God is there to please you. God is there to, to serve you. And it, it will be just like this earth. The, the earthly pl pleasures, you see. But I guess the, the, the Christians in the time of the Romans, their heaven would be, you know, something like a Roman bath instead of a swimming pool and badminton. They would be in a grape vineyard with a Roman bath nearby or, or whatever. Whatever the pleasures were of that time. Pleasures change and change and change and change. Now people think, oh, in heaven there'll be, there'll be, there'll be places for paintball wars, you know. We can have paintball gunfights because it's great fun. Or we'll go ice skating or sled riding. Or These are enjoyments. So they think heaven will be the place of perfected enjoyments according to how we have things there. But that would be a problem. And, and because that just means another gradation of this world, a place of enjoyments, a place of fun, and this type of thing. So, there are gradations of religion, religion, religious worldviews. Some of them have many problems. Some of them have less problems than others, and some have no problems at all. They have a perfect worldview, and they have a perfect theology and an understanding of spiritual perfection, what it is. In the spiritual world, it is just the opposite of that painting where Jesus is serving 
lemon juice to everyone there. It's just the opposite means we are there as servants to the Supreme Lord. But when we say servant in this world, that's a very down thing. Servant, house servant, maid, lower income bracket, lower housing, all these things are undesirable. Nobody wants to become a servant. But if we think of certain types of service, service to our country, service to our family, then service has a little more dignity. It is a noble thing. It is a, it is a great thing. Sometimes it is considered the greatest thing. Service of family, service of country. But if we think service of any other individual or anything, that's very low. So a service of family, the service of country has dignity, then what about service of God? How much dignity that, much ha that must have. So the most dignified position of any living being in this world or in the afterworld is to be a servant of God. So what that is, in so much detail, Prabhupada, our guru, he used to make fun and say, you want his phone number? We give you his phone number. Of course, he has no phone there. At least I haven't heard that God uses a telephone. But means that the information, what he looks like, what he does. We've only seen from Ma Mar What's his name? Michael Michelangelo, God looks like a retired weightlifter. It means he, he lifted a lot of weight. His arms are huge. They're very hairy <laughs> and a little wrinkly. You see. And that was in Michelangelo's time. So what must he look like now? You see. The hand is coming down to embrace man from heaven. So again, in that worldview, God is subject to old age. Or because he's the oldest. Um, you know, the first, he's the beginning, he must have grown old by now. You see. But now what if you had your choice? Now, some of us have lived up to almost 60, like Vishnu Mars. He's approaching 60. Or, 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 or your grandparents or relatives. So those who have lived life from birth and youth and everything up to old age. And you said, you've got your magic wand, you can wave it. Which stage of life would you like to be at forever? It definitely is down in the younger section. Nobody would say, yeah, I want to be old forever. <laughs> Nobody. Youth. So, if God is the all-powerful, all-everything, you know, why would he choose to be old forever? He would choose to be young forever also. At least he has a choice. You see. So, the Vedic concept is that God is ever youthful. Always young. In fact, if we, uh, they say you cannot see God. And we also say you cannot see God with these eyes. But God may reveal himself. And he has revealed himself. And, the, and his form is one of eternal youth. It is mentioned in the Vedas that we would compare him to something around 16 to 18 years old. Not old, heavy shaver, four o'clock shadow, white beard. All these things, wrinkles here in the eyes, none of that. Ever, ever, ever youthful, always young, always charming, always beautiful. So, <clears throat> anyway, we can't go into the whole Vedic conception here. We'll be here for years, so, but we'll, we'll try step by step. The Vedic conception of Krishna is the most complete conception of God that we have ever discovered in this world. So, God exists. God's eternal world exists. But a question arises. Some people will say, but why haven't we discovered this? Now when I say it exists, the Vedas say like this. There is this universe. We all marvel at the sun, the moon, the stars, especially on a clear autumn night and uh, so forth when we can see the, the stars, the Milky Way. It's just, it's just amazing. And we're out there. We're out there in spaceships. We're out there in probes. We're searching, searching. I recently saw a, a documentary where they were uh, describing all the different planets in our solar system. And if they all came from the same explosion or same, then there should be similarities amongst the planets. If you break a rock and throw it around the room, even the rock had a lot of different things in it, there's going to be similarities between the rocks and the room. There are no similarities between these planets, Mars, Venus, Saturn, Jupiter, and Earth. They are, they are so extremely different than one another, they couldn't have come from the same, same ball of clay. At least, they were saying, it's a, impossible to understand and how they've, because there was explosion, they say. And then gravity drew in all this, and it drew it in in places, and where it drew it in, it, it formed planets. Well, it's the same matter, but it's different everywhere. It's different. The atmosphere is this, 
Everything about it is different. It's, it's a big problem to explain the world just by random explosion of the Big Bang Theory. But when we consider creation, an artist says, I'm drawing blue circles here. I'm drawing red circles here. A creator is not restricted by anything other than their creative, creative ability. The creative will is there. And we see that throughout the uh, universe, the expression of the creator, diversity and wonder everywhere. We are, we are still marveling in science over this human body, and particularly in, in the brain. It's, it's, just, it's, just, it's a marvel. The eye, we are functioning within this, but individually you have no capacity to explain to yourself, to others, how you digest food, even breathing. Why don't you just stop breathing when you go to sleep and die in your sleep? You just breathe. So many things are just going on. This, this life is, is a wonder. It cannot be explained properly as evolving from frogs to fi fish to frogs to, to apes to humans. There, there are many problems with that. So, the Vedic literature says that there is a universe beyond this universe. That is the spiritual sky. There God lives eternally. That universe is infinite. This one is finite. The Vedic literature says that it's just not a place in Wonderland or La La Land or something. Like it's just kind of out there and you believe it. It's, it's out there. Theoretically, you could reach the border of that place with a rocket ship, if you had the proper rocket ship. I doubt if we ever have one in our time, but it is possible. Because the Vedic literature says the universe has an end, and that's still being speculated upon in, 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 in space sciences. I mean, how far does it go? Does it go forever? Then it must be infinite. If it goes forever and there's no end to the universe, because there's an end to everything, there's an end to this rug, end to this house, end to this state, end to this country, end to this planet, end of our atmosphere, end of our solar system, into another solar system. End is there. End is there in this world. So is there an end to all of it? If there is an end, be it a drop off into nothing or whatever, means in this world there, there are ends. Do you follow? So there must be an end to this universe. The, the, the Vedic literature says, yes, there is an end to this universe. And there we encounter the walls of the universe. And the walls of the universe encompass the whole universe. This creation is, is called a Brahmandra. It is just like a football. It is inconceivably huge within. Suns, moons, stars, planets, universes are all within. And outside the greater walls of the universe exists the spiritual world. There it is infinite. There is no end. There are no walls. The infinite and the finite. So, how to prove that? That would be a problem. And, 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 and a rationalist may say, then why, but why ha science hasn't discovered something about this? Why they haven't discovered that there is another world, there is another world? And that brings me just to this one point I wanted to mention, that they did. In 1959, two American physicists were given the world, uh, what is it called, the World Prize for Nobel. Physics, Nobel. Nobel Prize for Physics. They were... Two American atom atomic scientists were awarded 1959 Nobel F Physics Prize. They were an Italian-born Italian -born Dr. Emilio Segre, 69, Segre, yeah. and Dr. Owen Chamberlain, of San Francisco. But apparently the, both were Americans at the time. And they were awarded the Nobel Physics Prize for the discovery of the anti-proton, pro, proton, proving that matter exists in two forms, as particles and antiparticles. Then here's a quote. This is from a scientific journal. According to one of the fundamental assumptions of the new theory, there may exist another world, or antimaterial world, built up of antimatter. This antimaterial world would consist of atoms and subatom atomic particles spinning in reverse orbits to those of the world we know. If these two worlds would ever <clears throat> clash, they would both be annihilated in one blinding flash. So our guru, uh, 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 Prabhupada, he read this, I guess it was in the newspapers in the, at the time, and uh, 
Let me see. It says, no, it was in the Times of India he read it. 27th October, 1959. A news service dated Stockholm, 26th October, was published as follows. And, and this information was there. So they had discovered the anti, what they d d uh, classified as the antimaterial particle. Atoms, subatoms, spinning in an opposite way, making an opposite world. This world is made of atoms, protons, all these things spinning this way. And they said there's another place where they're spinning in the opposite direction, and this is another world separate from this one. And you can't connect, but it's there. So I, there, obviously there was much more to their theory than what I just read. Otherwise, you don't get a $150,000 prize, Nobel Prize for physics. It must have been a very elaborate uh, theory. However, and they mentioned here that if the two worlds ever collided, both would be destroyed. Then this book was written after that. It was written in 19, this is original copy, 1959. And Prabhupada, our guru, he tells there that, yes, the, it, fundamentally their discovery is true. There is another world. There is, a, there is an antimaterial world. But as it is antimaterial, destruction is not possible there. Destruction is something which is a material world happens in the material world. These atoms spinning, they can be destroyed, they can collide, explode, and all these things, and annihilation can take place. Anti-material means no annihilation can take place. And then he went on to say, no, no, no death can take place, no old age can take place, there is no anger, greed, lust, contempt, all the things that you can list in this world, good and bad, don't exist in that, in that spiritual world. Even the best of things that you list here, you, for example, goodness and kindness. Certainly these are, these, are, these are divine qualities. But when you list the quality, then you must study the quality and you'll find out that these things don't endure in this world. They're not permanent, you see. So goodness, compassion, love, these things exist in the spiritual world, but they are permanent. They are never subjected to be, subjected to be pulled down by a lower quality. So he goes on to explain many of the things about the nature of the spiritual world. But one interesting thing is this never went anywhere. This prize, this research, at least to our knowledge, never went anywhere, at least in the public eye. Maybe in the most secret places of secret service <coughs> or something, such research goes on. We have no way of knowing. Can you heard anything about that? <laughs> Probably it was just dropped because it's, it's not so economically viable. That's one thing. Another thing is <clears throat> scientific research that in the end it's like, uh-oh, same scenario. We got a god out there. They just drop it. Scientists don't want to deal with that factor. We call it a factor. It's a, it's a, it's a quantum factor. It exists and we have to deal with that. And uh, so um, <clears throat> how to know that? How to know that? Uh, how to experience that, all these things. How to know there's a spiritual world. How to know God exists. How to know I'm not this body. How to know I'm spirit soul. How to know I've had many lives. How to know I'll have another one. How to know. What is the real proof of knowing? I say, well, you see, see these books. And say, oh, there's so many books. This guy's book says it doesn't. Your book says it does. How do I know? Then you have to experiment yourself. You have to, you have to explore yourself. You just can't take the word of others. You take some advice which you feel is good and you have to explore with that. It's like Tulsi Munjuri went to uh, see some college yesterday in Bennington. So she heard something from a student. It's like you went one time and you hear something and then a lot of times you go and well sorry it's just not what it was played up to be. It's not as good as they said it was. And many things are like that. Nobody says Oh, my product is second best. You probably won't really like it, but anyway, buy it. Everybody says, this is the best. You'll like this more than anything. When you get it, you find out, oh, this is made in China. It's not so good. <laughs> what happened? Things like that. Spiritual life is similar. You have to experiment yourself. So in each age, there is a process of experimentation. It's not really experimentation, but there is a practice for each age. The universe has ages, just like we have summer, spring, winter, and fall. The Vedas say the universe has ages. They're not just climates. They are more than just climate. They deal with the very nature of things, the very nature of people, the most subtle things in our existence, you see. For example, truthfulness. 
is something that we still hold a value. If a politician lies, if a spouse lies, if our children lie, it is very much frowned upon. It is said that in this age, it is the only principle, religious principle, that is still looked upon with, with, with dignity, truthfulness. Um, but as far as other things, austerity. Austerity is a religious principle. Austerity. Um, uh, the, there's no interest. The people are not interested in austerity. People are, are only interested in comfortable living. <coughs> austerity of body, mind, speech. People have no, no interest in austerity. They want to live always a, the most lavish, lush type of life. Comfort, comfort. Actually, we live like kings now in this age. Even a, a poor person lives like a king. Hot and cold, running water, all these things. Of course, we look upon many of them as just necessities of life, but many people in the world didn't and still don't have all these necessities in life. Particularly in this country, we live a very good life, a very good life, very comfortable, high standard of living. Cold shower, this is an austerity. Waking up early in the morning. Nobody likes to wake up early in the morning. This is Sunday morning, and they're half this town is still sawing logs. And they will saw them until 10 o'clock in some cases. Farm life, country life, a little different. People wake up early. Go to Boston, you can hear the people snoring. <laughs> the whole sound is just through the city. You look out those windows on Sunday morning, it's like, what happened? The place got nuked. There's nobody out there. And people ah, start yawning at 10 and 11 and wake up. They love to sleep late. The only reason people get up early is they're driven to go to work. The only people that see the sunrise in this country are people on military watch and truck drivers. <laughs> Nobody sees the sunrise. You can ask many of your relatives and things like this, when's the last time you saw the sunrise? And you'll find it, and not just, just people, college kids, they ever see the sunrise? Yeah, just as they go to sleep. <laughs> They see it rise in the window just as they kind of check out. They were up all night, you know. Yeah. Austerity means rising early. I'm just making points here. Austerity and all the types of austerity. Um, you know this thing. We're all going on holiday. You know, this summer the whole country goes on holiday. It all spring. What is this word, holiday? Have you ever stopped and looked at this word? Holiday. It's holy day. Before a hundred years ago, there was no such thing as a holiday. The only days off work all over the world were religious holidays. Islam, Hindu, Christian, Jew. The only days off work were religious holidays. And the only time you went anywhere was to go visit a relative or go to a holy place and take a holy day. And now we have holy day ends, holiday ends, and there is nothing holy in a holiday end. <laughs> but it's just become a holy day. Like in Christianity. Christmas. What is Christmas? Christmas means Santa Claus buying gifts. It's Christ Mass. Christmas. We just roll the whole thing over and it becomes a just something completely, completely different. So, um, <clears throat> things weren't always as they are now. Holidays, vacations, these are, these are, these are something very, very, very new in the world. Um, so, what was the point? Um, Huh? Yeah, austerity. No, but going on a pilgrimage, going to a holy city, a holy place, traveling across the world, this is an austerity. Even if you're doing it in a jet in modern times, it's, a, it's an austerity to get on that plane, fly for 15, 20 hours, all these things, journey to a place of pilgrimage. Spiritual literature like the Vedas say, say that these austerities are purifying things. But people are not inclined to do that in this age. So, in previous ages, the first age of Satya Yuga, the process of self-realization is meditation. The average lifespan is many thousands of years. We even find in the Bible, people live for incredible lengths of time. Now, 70, 80, 90, 100, you're gone. They live for thousands of years. Meditation requires thousands of years. So it was a, it was a, it was a, a process that was applicable for the age. Now, meditation, we can't find time to meditate a few minutes a day, half hour, an hour, impossible. Impossible. Most people can separate 15 minutes maximum who meditate, actually. 
15 minutes. And what is the process of meditation? Staring at a candle and a few other things. Just trying to calm down the mind. That is, that is like just packing your swimsuit if you're going swimming. That is not actually meditation. You're just making your mind under control and calm. But that's become meditation today. The process of meditation is also there in the Vedas for the Sati Yuga. No one can perform proper meditation today in this age. There is not enough time in life. There are too many disturbances. As you sit and meditate, your not mind just, whoop, just goes off somewhere. Well, that's probably a radio show coming through, just picking your mind right out of the ether and just carrying it away. It is said that the mind is situated in the ether. Ether is not like the element in a science lab, ether. Ether is accommodating space for existence. Your mind is situated in the space within your body, and ether, <coughs> sound waves travel in the ether, and they go right through your skull right through your mind. Which brings us all the way up to Kali Yuga, one big jump. Fight sound with sound. There are so many pollutions into the ether. Sound enters the ether. In, in this uh, philosophy, it's called the ethereal element. Sound, fight sound with sound. So real meditation in this age is mantra meditation by chanting and filling your own head and the atmosphere around you with, with transcendental or divine sound then this purifies the atmosphere and, and one can actually meditate. But simply sitting like this, not for long, here comes you know, Radio Free Europe or psh, here comes you know, Wolfman Jack through the waves, means the atmosphere is contaminated, the mind will be swept away. We sometimes wonder, how the heck did I have that thought? Where did that dream come through? Turn on a radio and you'll find out. It's all right here. It's just right here in the air. Because we can't receive it with our fingers, stick a wire on a receiver here, and some guy's talking to us. It's all around us. In fact, in space, it's all in space, actually. Floating around in space, it just goes up. Some people's teeth pick it up. Yeah. And they just hear it. Yeah. <laughs> I remember in D.C., we, we had a radio <laughs> in one of our cars, and, and it kept picking up the cop cars in D.C. <laughs> 45 going over to so and so Thinking we're getting arrested. It was just like the speaker in the car just picking it up. It's all out there. All types of sound. All types of contamination. They say that word spoken is always there. Whatever we say, it's always there. It just goes. We can't hear it. The vibration goes. We lose sight of it by ear. We can't trace it. They say it's there. You know, in the, in, our, in, the, in the civilian world, there's a lot of rumors, people speculate, retired people write books, you don't know who's telling the truth and who's lying. But some, I've seen articles from time to time say that they have heard sounds in the universe and, and messages and just, you know, sound is there. Well, according to the Vedic understanding, yeah, it will be there. Whether you can recapture that sound, that's another thing. But it's there. Sound <coughs> just goes. So. The recommendation is make a holy sound, make a divine sound, a transcendental sound. Golo Kara Prema Don Hari Nam Sankirtan. The holy name of Krishna descends from the spiritual world to this world, and the chanting of that name is the recommended process for enlightenment. Enlightenment is a very wonderful thing. Like, uh, what, the, what was the example our chiropractor used? He said, inner peace, enlightenment, once you get it, you can't give it up. Who's comparing it to my arthritis? Once you got it, it doesn't go away. It's a very wonderful thing. It enables us to understand reality, truth. And even things like the greater universe, the existence of God, the highest types of truth, they are understandable and they are experienceable by those who are enlightened. You take a child or somebody running around here, doesn't know how this country is run, doesn't know who's in control of this place. In fact, I mean, I'm here, I don't even know who's governor of this state. I don't even know. Does that mean there is no governor? But those who are enlightened with higher knowledge, you know who the governor is, you know who the president is, and you know. Your, your son might not know who the president is. Eh, he's living within this country, he doesn't know. So that's a kind of an ignorance. But his ignorance doesn't nullify the president, because he doesn't know. So because people don't know these things, about the existence of God and so forth, doesn't nullify them. They simply do not know. Then, your son or somebody, you may know. Have you met Bush? Do you know? Do you know Bush is president? I didn't know he's president. Maybe it's a whole CIA scam on CNN. It's just some guy. 
as he's not the president. How do you know? How do you know? If you haven't met him and shook in his hand, how do you know he even exists? Well, oh, come on, we believe. Ah, you were going to say you believe CNN, you believe, you believe, the, you believe. The point is, you believe. Belief is there. How do you know we went to the moon? How many of us went there? How many of us know Wally Shira and all these guys? I once asked Wally Shira, are you sure you went to the moon? <laughs> <laughs> it's a really stupid question, but I did. I asked him at Gainesville University, and uh, we just wanted to see his response. You know, we're just feeling out all the possibilities, you know. And I told my friend, I'm sure he went. Um, my, uh, my father was friends with some of the early astronauts, and this is not a scam. They're, they're going, because there was so much talk. They never went, all these things like this. So we decided just to ask them one day. It was a very embarrassing question. <laughs> For him and us, for everybody. <laughs> it was in a meeting of aeronautics students at Gainesville University. But also, his reply was kind of a, uh, you know, interesting also, how he replied to us. But nonetheless, still, we believe it. It's belief. Only a few people have the hardcore evidence of that. So belief is not something which is undesirable in the human experience. Life is based on belief. What is money? What is money? It's paper. Why do you work for it? It's a bill. Because, it, well, it used to be backed by gold, then it was backed by silver. Now it's backed by, what's it backed by, Jai Day? Faith. faith. It's backed by faith. The amount of money that even exists in paper doesn't equal the numbers in the banking system. If you took, just froze the world, just America, and said, okay, all the money that we got in the bank, match it dollar for dollar here. You'd run out of dollars, and people would be going, where's my dollars? Well, they're just numbers. They're, they don't even have enough paper to go around. <laughs> it's true, but we believe in it. So belief's not a bad thing. Belief enables us to do wonderful things. Many things. Many things. But when we say we believe in God, people go, yeah, blind faith. They want to ridicule that. But actually our faith is not blind. It has experience. Faith produces experience. So self-realization means the experience of all these things divine, the confirmation of their existence. It doesn't mean you'll go, I saw it. I looked up there, I saw past Saturn, I saw the wall of the universe. No, not like that. I don't think so, not like that. But a confirmation <coughs> through faith that God exists and then, actually, it becomes quite logical about the universe and things, a logical understanding when you understand finite, which this material world is, and infinite. Finite always has an end. So, yes, this universe has its, has its end. Whether we would get to the end of it and go, I'm here on the wall of the universe, well, maybe not like that. But it has its end. And whether we will ever reach it, doubtful. Doubtful. <coughs> Nonetheless, these things are there. So faith. Faith is an essential thing. And the process of self-realization, chanting of the holy name, and the development of faith, this enable, en enables us to know the truth. Truth which cannot be perceived through the senses. Truth that cannot be seen through the telescope. Truth that cannot be perceived in any other way other than faith. And this is the most enduring thing throughout human civilization. We, civilization goes through ups and downs of many types and we keep coming back to this thing. People believe. They believe. So why society should encourage this? Instead of what, what do we call the secular state, nobody wants to get behind real belief, scientific belief. Everybody wants to just keep religion on. Everyone is doing but, you know, do, it, you do your own thing. And the world is just, uh, in this modern sense, has just uh, omitted this. There should be scientific research into these areas also. There should be scientific research into the soul, existence of the soul. And many of the things which are uh, mentioned in the Vedic literature, they may be experimented with to some extent. And this may give faith to people at a certain level to pursue an understanding of the existence of God and, and so forth. Do you understand a few things I'm covering here in a little talk this morning? So in every age there's a process. The next age was um, yagya, sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, that is also not possible. 
this age. Uh, there are many types of sacrifices, yagyas. You find, you see them in ancient cultures a little bit. Oh, human sacrifice. I'm not talking about that type of sacrifice. But there were different types of sacrifices that could be performed, ritualistic offerings and things like this, this process. Then the next age there was temple worship. That's what's left us, you know, uh, the mystery of temples in ancient uh, Egypt, in ancient India. There, there are many great temples and these things. Temple worship, the process of, of temple worship, this was uh, recommended. And now we're in Kali Yuga. All the previous three have only a small value. They can be done limitedly. In this age, the process is chanting the Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, 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 This is the process in Kali Nam Sankirtan. It is chanted on beads in our personal meditation, and it is chanted in a group that's called Sankirtan, as we were singing earlier. This, this simple thing. It is there in the Bible also. It is there in the Quran also. It is there in every scripture of this age that we have on the earth, basically. That one should chant the holy name of God is there. It is mentioned in all the other scriptures. But who is doing it? Nobody is doing it. It even says in the Bible that the, the devotees of God in the, in the modern age will write God's name on their forehead. Well, who does that? We do. The Baptists don't do it. The Mormons don't do it. I haven't seen the Pope do it yet. Who does that? It says in the Bible in Revelations that the devotees of the Lord will wear God's name written on their forehead. They will take cymbals and drums and go out into the street and sing God's name. Who does that? We do. Haven't gone out West Paulette lately, but <laughs> we do do that. We go out into the streets and we chant God's names. Who does that? In the Bible, Psalms 113, 1 and 3 is the place it says, Praise ye the name of the Lord from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Who does that? Who even woke up to see the sun? These priests are all snoozing away also. They're not getting up early. Too drunk from the night before. Or busy in the courtroom being sued for some horrible thing. I mean, not that they're all like that, but the fact is, it's right there in the Bible. Who does it? I just, you know, people bop in and out of there on Wednesday and bop in and out of there on Sunday for an hour. It's not a living thing. It's all right there. What to do, what to do. There's much more to do than just accept the blood of Jesus and all these things. There's a, whole, there's a way of living. There's a way of life. It's not there. It's not found. This is what's going on in most circumstances. Religion in different countries, different things came up. Then centuries later, it's a wash. Nobody's doing it. It's become an institution, a financial institution. You know, Catholic Church is the biggest financial institution in the world. Religion is not meant for that. We cannot. We we should not allow that to happen. It's a struggle. Eventually, it seems to happen again and again. So we're we're there where the ancients were. When religion began in ancient time in different places, and there were saints and there were scriptures, and people were doing it then. Well, that's where we are now in this modern time. We're in that space. We've come in touch with an ancient knowledge. People have come and represented that knowledge, taught us, trained us. We're, we're, we're living that. Church is not a place where you go on Easter to show off your new dress. That's, isn't that what it is? I've been there a hundred times. New suit hated that. <coughs> it's getting hot and stiff. You your new suit. Your sister's got a little pink skirt on. And everybody's styling it. Sure, what the heck does this have to do with the resurrection of Jesus? <laughs> and then, and then, there's the Easter egg hunt. <laughs> Eggs of all things, you know. We got the Easter egg hunt. And who brings them? A little bunny. <laughs> little bunny bunnies don't have eggs. The whole thing is a mockery of religion. <laughs> Styling, dressing. Holy day. And it's a holy day. And it's, it's a holiday. It's a holy day. Like that. I'm sure there's some real, real, real believers in there, but that's not how we grew up knowing it. So, now, we're in a similar circumstance, but like thousands of years ago. You know? Fortunately, we're not being persecuted. We live in a country where... We have freedom of religion. 
And I'm always telling you, you should thank your lucky stars for that. That's not how it is all over the world. I've been in a few countries in the world, and people do not have freedoms. So we have freedom. We're not being persecuted like Christians were in their early days and so forth. We live in quite moderately civilized times, at least in this country. We're not being, no, no situation like that. So we have the opportunity to practice and to do these things. And we're more, inter more interested in that than simply creating an institution. Because the fate of the institution is sealed. It becomes like all the other institutions. We have to have an institution to a certain extent. Most of the uh, people here, devotees here, you don't even know what our institution is. Because I never talk about it. Institutions are basically forced upon us by governments. You have to register, you have to 501c3, you have to have a name, you have to have a bank account, all that. What's that got to do with self-realization, religion, and God? It's nothing to do. That's just a social requirement. So there's a difference between the actual religion, the process of self-realization, and the institution. These are two different things. When they're in harmony, then they can be complementary to each other. But when the institution takes over, <coughs> then everything is, is finished, really, spiritually. Even it may go on for thousands of years. There must be the actual practice in, in these things. These are most important. So we're very fortunate that we're in that very, very beginning stage where we can just dedicate ourselves to practice and, and, and these things. Don't have to worry about a uh, big institution. We never vote on anything in this community. There's no voting. What's better than, than a democracy is when everybody is in harmony. Democracy means we've got two points of view and people fight like cats and dogs with each other. And one finally establishes a vote over the other and leaves well, one third of the guys unhappy. They're not happy with it. And then they're always fighting to bring down the other thing. There's a problem with a democracy also. It's highly rated in the world, but there are problems with democracy. Where will Pakistan be if in the next election they, they vote out Musarraf and vote in a Muslim radical by democracy? Then it becomes a terrorist nation overnight through democracy. So democracy in itself is not the end game. You see. It came about in a time when, when the monarchs were really bad. So anyway, we're not a political organization here, but I'm just pointing out we don't vote on things. We harmonize. Take everyone's opinion. We harmonize. And we have leaders. We have leaders that people have faith in. They are competent to accept the, the conclusion. I'll ask, what do you think the color should be? She says green. You say blue. He says red. I look around and take the opinion of others, and then the leader makes a decision. It's not a voting. So <clears throat> we're able to do this because we don't have to worry about a big institution at this time. All right, I said enough this morning on different things. So. <coughs> Jaydev, you have a slideshow you're going to show us, right? Of the India tour. Mm -hmm. This is your slideshow. This mm -hmm. is not, not my slideshow. Yeah, question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You're talking about the, uh, the, the age, this age, the process of realization mm -hmm. through uh, the Maha Mantra, through sound. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about the difference between the finite and the infinite. So uh -huh. it could be argued that you're trying to realize the infinite through something fun, through the process of sound. How do you, how do you explain? Mm. It seems illogical. Well, that, that seems illogical that you can realize the infinite through something finite. Yes. Well, there, that's that's one of the uh, one of the questions that comes up in Bhagavatam. How can you speak about something which is beyond this word world, spiritual, with words which are material? Yeah. So. <clears throat> Nothing exists outside of the uh, creation of the Supreme. This world is also created by him. It's one of his energies. He has his superior energies. He has his inferior energies. The name, the holy name, is a superior energy. It is not subject to the mundanity of this world. We're sitting here in America, but yet we can take a, a radio signal from very far away. And it can come to us and give us information of an event in Tokyo or London or some other place. So the holy name, Golokara Premadan Harinam Sankirtan, it descends from the spiritual world. It, it, it does not have, it, it actually doesn't have any of the material qualities. It is purely 
transcendental sound vibration. And when, when it is received in the descending process, the parampara, then it can reach all the way to the soul which is within this body, which is also not a material thing. The soul is not a product of matter. The soul itself is a superior energy and simply is surrounded by inferior things. So it can reach all the way to the soul. And there, when it, when it, when it, when it connects uh, at that level, mm -hmm. then that particular, uh, that particular soul can chant the holy name. The soul has senses. The soul has speaking, the soul has hearing, the soul has seeing, it has all the senses that we have now. These are all coverings over the spiritual senses of the soul. So the chanting actually begins from the soul upwards, the spiritual cry of the soul. The, the chanting is coming from the soul. And then the holy name can be chanted. But if, if someone doesn't put their heart in this, then that is not the holy name. Then it is lip deep chanting. It may sound, uh, in a sense, I can distinguish. I have heard many singings of the holy name in India, which are not the holy name. I have heard many modern rock and roll renditions of the holy name chanting the Maha Mantra, and they are not the holy name. In the beginning, we may not be able to discriminate what's really the holy name, and what is only uh, almost like a replica, it is called Abbas, the shadow. Only if we chant with great sincerity, we chant with our heart, we chant from the level of the soul, then we can actually chant the holy name. So it comes down like that, and it comes back from us like that. So you try this and, and, and see if it works. <laughs> If everything divine was perfectly explainable, then in many cases there would be no necessity of, of your personal experience. Examples are not perfect, and explanations are sometimes not, they're not perfect. Um, I heard many things in the beginning from classes, and I just, for example, I used to hear, you are not the controller, you are not the doer of anything, and I thought, well, I know I'm not the controller, but what do you mean I'm not the doer? I, I struggled with that for years, I'm not the doer. Uh, we don't do anything. You don't brush your teeth. Yeah, don't brush my teeth, I brush my teeth. <laughs> you don't brush your teeth, you're just observing the experience of brushing your teeth. You are the soul. You are not the teeth. You are not the hand. You are not the toothbrush. You are something removed from all of this. Right? And now, you know, 35 years later, a lot of life has just gone through like watching a car, uh, watching the world from a car. Because now I know who I am. I have the experience of who I am. Spirit, soul, servant of Krishna. I'm not the doer. So many things are done. They're just, they're just done. Sometimes I feel like I just drop that toothbrush and it would keep on brushing you. <laughs> It won't work. You drop the toothbrush, it'll fall in the sink. You see, but we're not the doer. You see, the body is doing so many things, and we have a desire. We have a desire. What if you're paralyzed, and you have a desire, but you can't move your hand? So there's somebody who's allowing your desires to be fulfilled. This is the supreme Lord, the Paramatma. You, man, disposes. Oh, no. Man proposes, God disposes. Now it's just all working very nice. You want to run, jump up, move, you know, have a scratch in your throat, <clears throat> cough, whatever you want. You just do it. But at any time, any of these functions can just be suspended. And you can't cough, you can't breathe, you can't do so many things, you can't move your arm. Any of these things can be suspended. And you'll experience, you have a will. And lastly, it comes to death itself. And everyone has the will to live, yet death is imposed upon us. We're not even, we're not the doer. We're not, we're not the cause of our own life. We have a life that will, that will end. But we want to, we want to live on.
and we will live on. We live on in the next life. If we are engrossed in so much ignorance, then we are born again. Krishna says there's no loss. Everyone will be born again. And the, the old, they will be born and they will have fresh new lives. They will be free from these bodies of aching and painting. They will be born again. They're fresh and young. Life will be there. Now I want to improve the standard of life from a world of repeated birth and death and ignorance and you learn a language and you forget it in your next life, you've got to learn again. You, 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 you hate, and just think, and there's a positive, we hate the Arabs so much, the next life we're born an Arab. Hate attaches us to them. The Chaitanya has an impassionate, there's, there's, there's a certain anger necessary for fight, but hatred is something different. We don't hate the doer. We hate the activity. There's a difference. That person, those Arabs, they're also spirit souls. But they're so engrossed in a certain plane of ignorance. You see? And one day they'll be, they'll be free from that ignorance. This can happen. They're terrorists. They die. They have to be born in another country and they'll be terrorized. They'll be blown up. They blew up, they'll be blown up. Eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, Jesus said. The problem is, if someone doesn't stop this, there'll be no man with an eye and no man with a tooth left in the world. <laughs> All be blind and toothless. <laughs> so, <clears throat> there are many things involved in, the, in this world. And uh, it's not always possible to see the most far-reaching extremes of those things. 